this is in the series we've been talking about, about narrow is the path, but we are on the subject in this series talking about once saved, always saved, and uh, just this subject alone will make it three more parts uh, besides um, what we did last week. So this is the second part on this topic in the series. If you would, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy 4, and we're going to look um, at verse, specifically verse 4, but the context of it is verse 1 through 5 there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and actually I'm sorry, it it's uh, chapter 4, but it's, it's starting verse 1, that's the specific verse we're going to look at, but the context goes all the way to verse 5. Um, so in talking about once saved, always saved, um, there are a lot of folks that believe in this, that talk about it. Um, when I put last week's, I just put last week's message up just a couple of days ago on YouTube and there was already like 15 views on it. So, I mean, it, it, that's been one of the most popular videos I've put up so far um, just in 48 hours to have that many because I don't have a ton of followers yet on YouTube. It takes a while to get there, but you can tell how incredibly sensitive of the subject and how much people, um, you know, pay attention to this. And it's sort of up there in the top three in terms of like, you know, judge not. Everybody wants to talk about that. And then once saved, always saved. Um, and there's a lot of people who argue and say this. They say, well, if somebody if somebody quote unquote turns away from the faith, then uh, and they say that because they don't believe there's anything in the Bible that really talks about that, then they just simply say, well, they probably weren't saved to begin with. You know what I'm saying? They'll say, well, they weren't even saved then if they because you can't you can't turn away from the faith. Um, and I'm like, man, what Bible are you reading? There are copious amounts of scripture that talk about turning away from the faith. And this is one of them right here. First Timothy chapter four, uh, verse one, it says the spirit expressly states. All right. This is complete Jewish Bible um, uh, version here. The spirit expressly states that in the archaic times or the ancient, the, the last days, some people will apostatize from the faith by paying attention to deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So, um, it's basically saying in the last days, and this is where really the warning about falling away from the faith takes place, is it's talking about the end times, okay? It's talking about the last days. And, and it says people, some people, so not all, but some people will apostatize from the faith. Apostatize, fall away, turn their backs. That's one of the definitions of apostatize. So how can... How can I have not have been saved to begin with and turn my back on the faith? If, if once saved, always saved is true, all right, and I can be saved and I can't turn my back on the faith, then why is this verse in here? You know what I'm saying? Why is this verse amongst a bunch of other verses that we're going to go through? In fact, go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at this as well. But why is that verse or any other verse in there? Why is there a warning? In fact, it says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit expressly states, you know, in the last day, expressly. I mean, I mean, what's a, a, a synonym for the word expressly? Come on, Samantha, help me out. Synonym for expressly. God. <laughs> expressly, well, no, not necessarily flamboyant, but it's expressly is like, is like vehemently, just like it boldly, it is... Yeah, it proclaiming loudly. You know, I mean, this is what it's saying here. The, the Spirit is saying, hey, <laughs> in the last days, there are going to be some people who apostatize by, from the faith by turning away their attention to deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So another clue here is just in that verse is deceiving spirits. So that means that you had to have had the truth and been deceived from it to turn your back on it, right? If you're already deceived, you can't be deceived. Are you all with me? I mean, we're just talking about, man, this is not curing cancer or building rockets here. This is some simple stuff, you know, right here. This is some simple proof. Paying attention to deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And once again, this is not talking about 
folks in the world, okay, who aren't saved because once again, if you're deceived, already you can't be deceived because you already are. So this is talking about people in the church, in the body of Christ, you know, that they will be deceived, they'll apostatize, they'll turn away. Colossians chapter 1, and let's look at uh, verse 21. It says, in other words, you who at one time were separated from God and had a hostile attitude towards God, uh, towards him because of your wicked deeds, he has now reconciled in the son's physical body through his death in order to present you holy and without defect or reproach before himself. Okay, so let's stop for just a second and, and let's just. You know, it's pretty plain and simple, but let's break it down. Let's unpack it even more and let's look at it. What is it saying? It's saying that at one moment of time, you were in darkness. You were separated from God, but then through the life of Jesus, his death and his resurrection, you have been reconciled to God, right? You've been reconciled to God and that you might be presented without defect, holy, so on and so forth. Oh, but there is a stipulation. The Bible, uh, people don't think the Bible has stipulations, but it does. Verse 23, watch. Provided. All of that is true. Provided, of course, that you continue in trusting, uh, in your trusting, grounded and steady, and don't let yourselves be moved away from the hope offered in good news that you heard. So right there, it's saying that there's, you know, you can walk away, you can apostatize, you can, you can uh, fall away from the faith, you can turn your back on it, because why? It says provided that you continue trusting, which means that you could stop, right? That you stay grounded, that you are steady, that you don't let yourself be moved away from the hope offered and the good news you have heard. Don't let yourself be moved away. We were talking about this a little bit last week, but I, I think it bears mentioning again, and that is that when we get saved, when we get born again, okay, we think, we think that it's just not, not you guys because you guys don't think this way, okay, right? But, but there, are, there are people, there are folks who think that you get saved and that's just, that's it. You know, that's, it's all good. The, the, the journey is done. I received Jesus. Now I can live my life. And it's like having life insurance. You don't have to think about death. And it just, you know, because when you die, you got money coming to your loved ones kind of thing. But salvation only begins whenever you receive Jesus. That is the beginning of a journey. Um, and I mentioned, I think, last week, too, that, you know, I remember Ted Turner saying years ago that, that Christianity was for weaklings. People who are weak-minded and weak and so on and so forth. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It gets tougher after you receive Jesus. That's when the heat gets turned up. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, I talk to, I've talked to a lot of people over the years that say that their life seemed to be kind of easy, and then they got saved, and it got really, really difficult, right? So I'm like, hey, Ted, give Jesus a try and talk to me again in, in 90 days, you know. And tell me how difficult it is then because, because following after doing the wrong thing is always easy. Living right is always difficult. It's always difficult. And that's when the journey begins, right? That's when it begins. Let's look at 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. I told you, man, listen, this is, this is this verse and then I've got five, six, I mean, I have got tons of scripture uh, because I don't want anybody to walk away from this uh, thinking that oh you're only basing this whole concept or whatever philosophy off of a few scriptures listen we can base it off the whole bible I mean basically I mean I've got tons of scripture here second Peter chapter 2 verse 20 I'm gonna go ahead and start reading uh, indeed if they have once escaped the pollutions of the world through knowing our Lord and Deliverer, Yeshua the Messiah, and then have again become entangled and defeated by them, their latter condition has become worse than their former. I mean, listen, y'all. If, if once saved, always saved is true, then this is a mistake. That's a, that, that verse shouldn't even be in the Bible. 
Are, are you all with me? I mean, it's, I mean, just read it again. Indeed, if they have once escaped the pollutions of the world through knowing our Lord and Deliverer, Yeshua the Messiah, and then have again become entangled. This is describing somebody who was delivered from the world, delivered from the devices of the enemy, and got right back in the mud again, so to speak. And it says they have be, their, their latter state is worse than their former. Why? I mean, Paul talks about later on, he says, it would have been better for them to have not known the truth than to know the truth and turn their back on it. Right? It says in verse uh, 21, and here it right there, better than to have not known the way of righteousness than to fully knowing to turn uh, from the holy command delivered to them. Wow. I mean, it is, it is specifically, I mean, stating here that they knew it and yet they turned away from fully knowing, turned away from the holy command delivered to them. And then, you know, you read that. You know, I've had these debates with folks, and you read that verse to somebody, and they say, that's because they were never saved to begin with. And it doesn't say, they, it doesn't go on to say, that's because they were never saved to begin with. <laughs> it says they turned their back on the command, right? Let's look at some more scripture. Matthew chapter 24. Um, and this is one of my this is one of my uh, go to scriptures right here. Whenever I have somebody come up to me, if they know I'm a pastor, I mean I've literally met people, and and they find out I'm a pastor, and I haven't had this happen in a while, but I've I've had it happen before. They'll find out I'm a pastor, and they'll go, "Oh, you're a pastor? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I am. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about once saved, always saved? I mean, I've literally had." You know, that question. They don't even know who I am, and they just want to know what I think because I'm a pastor. And this is one of my go-to verses right here. Matthew 24, um, 13 through 15 is in context, but I just want to specifically focus on verse 13. It says, but whoever holds out, oh, and let me stop and say this. Of course, everybody knows this, I think, but let me just make this clear. Matthew 24 is the end times chapter. I mean, this is this is... Jesus' famous end times chapter, and just before this scripture, a few verses up, he says, or it's actually a few verses down, I think, he says, the first thing he does when he warns about the end times, he says, be careful that you are not deceived. Be careful you are not deceived, right? So this is what verse 13 says, but whoever holds out till the end will be delivered. Uh, A lot of versions, this is the complete Jewish Bible, a lot of versions say, Whoever holds out or holds on or endures until the end, the same shall be saved. Right? So I remember I remember um, I was singing at my graduation, um, senior in high school graduation. There was about, I don't know, is a is a building. I went to a private school, so I was one of 12 people that graduated. It was a small graduating class. Um, and so we, the building was just a little bit bigger than this. It was about 350 people in the place. And, uh, and me and this other guy were singing a song and we were singing uh, two-part harmony and, and we had this thing figured out, man. We, we had practiced it a million times and everybody was like, man, you guys sound awesome. It's going to be an awesome song and everything else and blah, 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 blah. And I got up there, and he got up there. His name's Jamie. And we got up there, and we, we started to sing. And he couldn't remember all of a sudden. I don't know what it is about, about it, but sometimes you just have like these. I was having some timers at 18 years old. I mean, I don't know what was going on. He, he was too. Because all of a sudden, he forgot like the part he was, the key he was supposed to start it. And I think he started on mine. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, what was his I'm trying to find it in my head. And then it came to my part to sing the part because we were singing together on the course and he would sing part of the verse and I would sing part of the verse. And it came to my time to sing part of the verse. And while I'm trying to find my part in my head, I lost control of my thought process about the verse. So I was like, hmm. 
And then all of a sudden, oh, there it is. Blah, 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 blah. And I started singing. And he's sitting there going like this, oh, man. And he's like, he knows that he messed me up. And then it messed him up. But we got it together in the course, in the first course. We sang the chorus. And I'm telling you, the, the beginning was horrible. It was, it was disastrous. I've had dreams about that since then. It was horrible, right? But we got it together on the first course, and from there on out, we finished really strong. In fact, we probably sang it from there on out better than we had ever sang it in practice, right? So you have these two contrasting things. The worst we had ever done and the best we had ever done <laughs> in one singing, and, uh, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. My, and in fact, we had a reunion several years ago, and, um, and I walked up to him. We always called him Preacher, and, uh, and he, was our, he was also the principal of the school, and I walked up to him, and, and I reminded him of this moment. But he came up to me right after, I mean directly after, he made his way right to me and Jamie, and he grabbed my hand, and he looked at me. He said, son, it doesn't really matter how you start. It's how you finish, and you finish strong. And he said, and that goes for life. You might start shaky. You might even make some stumbles in the middle. He said, but you know what? People are going to remember how you finished today as opposed to how you began. And I said, sir, I sure hope so. <laughs> He said, trust me, he said, they'll, they might think about how, you know, you messed up, but they're going to say, but man, they finished strong. He said, it's always about how you finish, okay? And so I tell you that story because when you come down to an altar or if you sit in your living room and you had listened to Billy Graham and that's how you got saved, however it was that you received Jesus, that's how you started, but it's how you finish that is going to make the difference, okay? If you can end trusting him, if you can end knowing him, if you can end being a disciple, whether it's because you hear the trumpet sound and the eastern sky is split and you see Jesus and you are caught up, or you die and you go home to be with God, it's how you finish and Jesus even makes mention of that right here. But whoever holds on until the end will be delivered. Whoever endures until the end, the same shall be saved. So you're saying, you trying to tell me I'm not saved when I go down there and I give my heart to Jesus? You trying to tell me that when I prayed the prayer with Billy Graham, I didn't get saved? No, I'm telling you that you got saved then, but you're going to really be saved if you finish that way. That's how. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like that. They don't like that. But here it is, you know, I've always said, and sometimes it's black and white and sometimes red. <laughs> right there, it's red because Jesus said it. I mean, how do you argue with that? How do you make an argument against Jesus saying, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved? You know, you can't. You can't make an argument against that. Um, so let's look at, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Holding on till the end, the same shall be saved. And I think of the reason why a lot of folks balk at that and they, they, they buck against it and they're just like, no, 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 you say is because they want, once again, and this is the danger with once saved, always saved, they want to be able to get Jesus as life insurance and then live however they want to live, you know? But you know the problem with that is, is that that's the deception from the beginning. That's, that's the deception from the beginning, all right? And so to those folks, I would say, yeah, you probably weren't saved to begin with if that's all you went to Jesus for, Okay is to make sure you didn't die and go to hell, all right? Um, because it's all about the fruit of our lives. And that's the other problem, is that when Christians live, all right, like they're once saved, always saved, and so they can just live reckless lives, people in the world look at that and say, they're supposed to be Christians, but they look just like me. 
They're supposed to be Christians, but they act just like me. They talk just like me. They listen to the same music I listen to. They go to the same club I go to. Right? They drink the same whiskey, I drink, the same beer, the same this. They smoke the same cigars. They, they use the same language I use. They watch the same garbage on TV I watch. How are they different from me? How are, I believe in Jesus just like they do, but yet they say I'm not saved. I don't get it. I don't get it. And listen, I've talked to folks like that. And this is what I tell them. I say those are people who have acquainted themselves with Jesus, but those are not people who follow Jesus. They don't have any relationship with him. They don't keep his commands, and there are a whole lot of folks in the church like that. Not any of you guys. You guys are incredible, right? Right? <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 12, and it goes through 14. But it says, so my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey now when I am away from you. Keep working, watch this, keep working out your deliverance with fear and trembling. Your, your version might say, keep working out your salvation with fear and with trembling. And so here's the other, one of the other arguments that the once saved, always saved crowd uh, throws out on the table, okay? And this is the big one. It might even be the biggest argument that they throw out there is they'll throw out there and say, I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace, okay? I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace. And if I have to earn my salvation, that means I'm not, I wasn't saved to begin with because I'm doing it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Man, have you ever read the book of Philippians, let alone chapter 2? I mean, this is one of the, I grew up memorizing that verse in Sunday school, in, in children's church. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? And, and the, the grace folks, once saved, always saved folks. Uh, and I have it, just so you know, I've got it. Um, I got it abbreviated in my notes, so every time I see it, it's, it's OSAS. O-S-A-S, OSAS. They always sassing you about, you know, stuff. I mean, you know, that's just my whole, that's how I remember. You know, there's, oh, they're sassing me again, OSAS. They're, they're sassing me about, you know, giving me salt about, uh, well, if I, have to, if I have to earn my salvation, then I'm not really saved, and that's not the God I want to serve, and blah, 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 blah. But yet it says, Work it out with fear and with trembling, okay? And they say, well, I don't want to have to be afraid of God. That's not, that can't be what that verse is saying. It's not that you are afraid of God. And let me, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you the breakdown on this, okay? Let me, once again, let's unpack it a little bit. What does that look like? The fear of, and because Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Okay, so what does that fear look like? Is it, is it, you know, haunted house fear? Absolutely not. And see, that's what, is it, it and that's what people start associating fear with, okay? Is it fear uh, of paranoia? Okay, because here, here's, what, here's what they argue when they argue this works thing and, and everything else. And, and I see the balance of it, all right? But they say, if that's the way it is, and i got to work at my salvation, and it's works, and this and that, and everything else. What if, and I've had this, literally, somebody ask me this question. What if I'm walking around the edge of the bed in the morning, and it's still dark, and I had to get up and use the bathroom, and I stub my toe. And I'm, not, I'm talking about just not stub it. I'm talking about I break it. Nick is going everywhere like this. I know, he's, I know he's done it. And I don't know if there's anybody alive who hadn't done it. I've done it before. And you break that. I mean, you just break the toe. You break it. You evil Knievel break this thing. It's shattered. You know what I'm saying? And you happen to do that. You're saved. You read your Bible every day. You pray. You, you are a disciple of Jesus. But when that toe breaks, there something slips out of your mouth. 
Maybe from, you know, and as soon as it does, you grab it and say, oh, Lord, forgive me for saying that. Oh, this hurts so bad. And you're going down. And they'll argue and say, are you trying to tell me then if I, if I break my toe and I let a word slip out, then if I don't ask for forgiveness of sins right then and there and Jesus happened to come right after I break my toe, I'm going to go to hell. Like, no, that's what grace is for because you aren't perfect and you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. But grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. It's not a license to live the way that you want to live. Grace is there in case you make a mistake. See, it's a difference between living some way and making a mistake. You know, if I walk around and my language is constantly cursing people out and everything else, there's something wrong with my heart. Are you all with me? That's a, that's a lifestyle. And I'm not talking about lifestyle. I'm talking about mistakes. All right. And so, no, of course, if you, if you, you know, make a mistake like that or you're driving down. Another example, you're driving down the highway and, you know, somebody cuts you off and you're like, I am going to, I wish I could just break their neck. I want to break. And you have, you have, no, you're not even swearing. You're just like, you imagined your hands around their throat. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know that's not Christ-like? <laughs> right? It's not Jesus. That's not what he would do. But, but here's the thing. If, if, what happens if you die in a car accident a split second later? Or Jesus comes back a split second later and your last thought was, oh my gosh, I are, are y'all, do y'all understand what I'm talking about? We're, we're, that means that none of us have hope. That means that none of us have hope because there is not anybody in this room that is perfect. There's nobody in this room that has continuous, perfect thoughts. If you do, come up to me afterwards and we're all going to lay hands and pray on you because you have the biggest lying spirit I have ever encountered. You cannot live that way. Nobody does. Nobody does, okay? And even if it's the slightest infraction on the law, you're guilty. And that's why Jesus came. But then what does Paul say in the book of Romans? Does that mean I go on sinning? God forbid. God forbid. My life should show that there is a difference. Okay, that I have changed, that there's something different about me, right? Work out your fear, your salvation with fear and with trembling. The fear is this. Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. And with all of my heart, I don't want to disappoint him. You understand that? That's the fear with fear and with trembling. Oh, man. Don't let me waste this gift of salvation. Help me to be salt and light, Jesus Yeshua. Help me to be a witness everywhere I go for you. And don't let my life, Jesus, uh, Paul, David talked about this in Psalms uh, chapter 19. He, says, he said, let, let everything about me be pleasing to you. Let my life be like incense. I don't want to disappoint you. And he said, deliver me. This is even what David prayed. He said, deliver me from my unknown iniquities. He said, if there's something, basically what he said was, if there's something that I'm doing that's disappointing you and I don't realize it, show it to me. Because I don't want to be disappointing to you in any way. I don't. Have you all ever had the... Have you all ever had that feeling of you don't, you know, somebody puts their faith in you or they give you a task or so on and so forth, and you're like, man, I hope I don't disappoint them. I hope I make them proud of me. This is how we should live for Jesus. Man, I don't want to disappoint him. He gave his life for me, and I want to live my life for him. And in any way, in shape, form, or fashion, I don't want to disappoint him. And I know I will. And so when I do, I'm so grateful that he's understanding, that he's merciful, that he's forgiving, that he's long-suffering, and that he endures with me. And I'm going to do everything I can to please him. But Jesus, thank you. When I don't, you forgive me. That is with fear. That's working out your salvation with fear and trembling, with the attitude of, oh, I don't want to disappoint. Oh, and let me. And the trembling is... Let me be careful in how I live my life so that I'm pleasing to him in every way.
Um, and this is this is one part. In fact, I might have just mentioned this. Uh, people, people with OSAS uh, disorder. <laughs> Y'all with me? All awake? OSAS, once saved, always saved. People with OSAS disorder, they, uh, they argue Romans chapter 5. So if you would go ahead and turn there real quick. I'm going to let you guys go here in just a moment. Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 20. Romans 5, 20. I'm making you get them pages unstuck today, ain't I? Right? Romans 5, 20. It says, and the, and the Torah came into the picture so that the offense would proliferate. Now, this, is, this is a favorite verse by the OSAS people. They like to use this verse because they want to, they want to show how uh, you have to be once saved, always saved. It says, but where sin proliferated, grace proliferated even more. Uh, your version might say, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The, and it might say, the first part of that might say that the law came into the picture so that the offense would abound, all right? So one might say that no matter how much they sin, God is always there and God's grace covers it all, all right? And once again, we just talked about that. No need to go back over it, but we understand the balance to that. We understand what grace is there for. They may also say that the law is impossible to keep, and so one should not even try. I'm sorry, but I can't find that scripture. I never saw a scripture that said, Thou is cannotest, keepest the law. Therefore, thou should not even tryest. I mean, I've never read anything like this in any version. All right? That's not in all what it says. In addition, they say that the new covenant does away with the law. This is ignorance of God's word and perpetuates a lifestyle of disregard and is a very worldly view of Christianity. First of all, let's break down the scripture. People view Torah coming into the picture as a negative, coming to condemn and to accuse. The notion that the law coming in the picture as a condemnation or an accusation is to suggest that there should be no law at all. A suggestion of anarchy to God's law, or any kind of law, right? It is also to suggest that there should be no one telling us what to do and that everyone should do what is right in his own eyes. And the Bible speaks of this danger. In Judges 17, 6, it says, At that time there was no king in Israel, and a man simply did whatever he thought was right. What he thought was right. There is a danger in doing what we think is right. How do we know this? Because Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There can be a way which seems right to a person, but at its end are the ways of death. There is a way which seems right to a man or to a woman, but the way at the end is the way of death. You could be marching to it and say, this seems right, and find yourself standing at the gates of hell. We've all heard the, the phrase before, the, the road of good intentions, you know, or the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, I think I'm doing the right thing, but you find yourself standing you know, at the gates of hell. Why? Because without God's law, men always have the opposite of right. We will never have within ourselves the capacity to do and to discern that which is right. That's why the law of God, the word of God is there. In fact, in fact, there is, there is um, the whole, the whole, when you, when you look at, I'm trying to remember the, the ancient philosopher um, that talked about, oh man, his name's on the tip of my tongue. I'll remember it, you know, like what I'll meet in lunch today. Anyways, when you look at ancient law, everything, Okay, everything throughout the ancient world, its law came back to basic, basically what was the Ten Commandments. Even today, of course, until just recent times, our law is predicated upon Ten Commandments. You could, you could go into any courthouse and find them there until they started taking them down. Right? Isn't it amazing how in today's society, People wonder what in the world. People are losing their minds. They're, 
Why? Because you're removing the law. Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember. There was, uh, there there is a famous. I can't remember anybody's name today. A famous um, historian, and he's a he's a born again believer. Um, anyways, he said this not too long ago. I saw a documentary, and he says if you remove the law. Go ahead and, and just kill off society because they'll do it to themselves anyway. Take the law out and people will kill each other. I mean, it, they, and they'll kill themselves because there isn't. What is the law? The law is the moral standard by which we measure our lives to of right or wrong. If you take out the law that discerns for us right and wrong, then everything is right. That's the way we'll discern it. Because we'll do what is right in our own eyes. Isaiah warns against this too. Isaiah 5.20 he says, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who change darkness into light and light into darkness, who change bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter. Bitter. Many think the law has been done away with, but Jesus himself said this in Matthew 5, 17. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah, the law, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but I have come to complete or to fulfill them, to fill it up. In fact, Jesus also says in the book of John this, in John chapter 14, verse 21, he says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Right? And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will show myself to him. Listen, there are a lot of folks who say, Jesus, we want more of you. We want to see you. Show your face to us. Okay? You know how we get Jesus to show himself to us? By obeying what he says. That's how we get more of Jesus. Listen, and I'm going to end with this, and I'm going to bust some bubbles right here, maybe not in this room, but maybe when people watch on YouTube. You do not, you do not, okay, you do not get more of Jesus necessarily down at an altar. You do not get more of Jesus by singing a song. Not necessarily. You can, okay? But those are things subsequent to something else. You do not get more of Jesus by fasting. You can, but not necessarily. You do not get more of Jesus, okay, by getting up and praying every day for three hours. Because you can do all of that stuff, but if you are disobedient to His Word, you do all of that in vain. It doesn't mean anything. Because I don't show Jesus that I love him by how much I pray, by how much I memorize his word, by how much I worship, by how much I abstain from the world, by how much I don't cuss, by how much I don't get mad at folks, by how much I sing worship songs, by how often I go to church. I show him I love him by obeying what he says. Okay? Because if I don't obey, then all of those things are just liturgy. They're just actions. All right? And the irony is this. James said, in the book of James, he said, faith without works is dead. Okay? And he said, and then he goes on, James is, James is just hardcore. I think James, if he was alive today, he'd be from like Brooklyn, New York, or something like that. James is hardcore because this is what he says. He said, y'all, and this is, this is, this is how he'd say, he'd say, he'd say, you guys, all you guys do is talk about your faith. I can show you mine, right? That's what he said in New York, Brooklyn style. He said, you guys talk, but I can show you my faith. But there has to be a balance to that. The action doesn't mean anything unless it's built on the foundation of obedience. Obedience is the master key to every door in the kingdom of God. I'm going to say that again. Obedience is the master key to every door in the kingdom of God. Obey. What, what happened 
what happened when they built the temple. In Exodus, it's like 30, chapter 30, I believe it is. If I'm not right, I'm, I'm at least in the ballpark. Okay, I'm in the neighborhood. It said God gave the pattern for the wilderness tabernacle. They, he gave the, the, the blueprints. They obeyed, the Bible says they obeyed to every, to the tenth degree. They obeyed everything exactly, and they built it. And when they obeyed, the glory of God fell. What was the key to God's glory? Obedience. 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 That is the key. That's the master key to all of it. And obedience, when you plug that into the idea of once saved, always saved, that means that I cannot accept Jesus and then just do what I want to do. Because that means I'm doing what seems right in my own eyes and I'm not obeying his law and doing what he asks me to do. Thank you.